Hello there everyone and welcome back to TNO The Last of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Mokula. Well, of course, we're continuing with this campaign in which we are playing with the Toolbox Theory 3 update, Unfinished Business, but we got to talk about the invasion impending. The Caribbean Legion is wrapping up its training plans, which have had moderate success. The landing in Puerto Plata is planned to, or scheduled to begin in two months after deliberation between the Department of Defense and Joint Intelligence Agencies of both Mexico and Cuba. In coordination with this, a generalized uprising is planned to occur in cities across the country. Assume that Trujillo's regime and his foreign backers are aware of the plans of the invasion and uprising. Reports provided by local officers have noted that the Legion have improved in their abilities, but the previous experience limited the benefits. Some weapons and communication supplies have been granted to local insurgent assaults and regiments. They will join the uprising with the expectation that they shall distract Trujillo's military outside of key regions for landings. Recent crackdowns from Trujillo's regime have targeted key cells. Attackers seem more in line with Iberian anti terrorist methods, furthermore. Dominican stockpiles are reportedly acquiring modern air defense systems, suggesting that investments are being made to discuss or dissuade invasion. Uh, it's important to recognize that this risk, or the risk is posed to the planned intervention. These likely won't uh, preclude defeat, but involvement from foreign governments risks turning the conflict into a protracted struggle, which would jeopardize the success of the operation. Many of those risks, however, have been known for a long time. Agents have attempted to discover and capture foreign agents, but their focus remains on enduring or ensuring the landings succeed. It would be advisable to provide the Caribbean Legion with firm support from the U.S. Air Force and Navy to, to minimize risk, and you should know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So. The invasion will begin in 60 days, in which we're going to make operational strength as high as possible. Um, supplies will increase by 10. Our supplies 100 out of 100. Minimum supplies 90. We have 6 out of 5. Building over 5 will drain everyone a little bit faster. Whatever. Um, we still are going to go with the NPP. As we're also doing stuff here too. Can we do anything here? I want more political power, of course. Success is always nice as well, too. Increase our speed. Look at some cigarette cameras first. Uh, can't do strength and pro American sentiments. I think we do it right here. Not too much. Nationalists, progressives, um, Salazar, here. Oh, that one, because we can. But we got quite a few comments to go through as well. Uh, let's see, toolbox theory. I think I read this before. How long did it take him again? If you want to read this again, please go right ahead. Um, how long did it take him again? Yes, yes, yes. So we'll go with that. Additionally, oh, we should be on here too. We did help take out. We capitulate at least one of these areas first, which is very nice, actually. Um, Diego Suarez. Oh, there they go. Look at that. Beautiful. Let's see what you can do right there. Um, one of the comments from one of the comments from the last video was, "Hey, since Toolbox Theory or Unfinished Business Three was released, could you finally do some R campaigns, Octan? Hey, maybe I don't know. We'll play Toolbox Theory or you know, Tino a lot more. Someone says, "Yes, more Tino. My favorite mo Hoy Four mod by far." Someone says, "I look forward to to Philip Hart's content as we get down there." So. Um, someone says, hopefully they fix the economy and then My Little Pony's April Fool's Path in this mod. I'm not try that out yet. We should try it out sometime. Um, do I want him in? Or just help with support the attack right there, too. That's a victory over there. Um, what do we have here? Oh, the Blitz. So, they're not doing anything yet. We're down here, and then there's this one, too, so. Free supply. It's fine, it's only, yeah. As much operational strength as possible. Let's move around first, and then we'll attack them. And come on, take both boys. See what you can do about that. As we strike the match, of course, as well. If you want to reread that again, ooh, the two coalition system. Please go right ahead. But the National Progressive Pact is growing in influence, popularity across the nation, and increasingly seen as a viable alternative to the decades-long Republican-Democrat dominance of American politics. Though the MPP is on the rise, it can certainly be made to rise a little higher. But for example, some government resources were sent their way without anyone being made the wiser. Alternatively, we can shore up support for, from the RDC instead. I know that the MPP's rise is nothing more than a passing fad. Nevertheless, whomever we choose will have a bigger chance of winning the race to the Oval Office in 6-4. Time for some change. Status quo exists for a reason. It's not for a wee bit of a change. So it says, uh, for the next time, can you play as France and Tino, please? I've been waiting a long time. Um, ooh, organized supplies, of course. I'm not going to be concerned about doing any of this stuff here, guys. It doesn't even matter. Since we get a lot of stuff here, anyways. 15's not bad, but we're doing very well, anyways. I'm not concerned. Ship the little olive men. The Philippine rebels will be able to additional, few additional division. Our industry will slightly increase our GDP. Get more guns. Let's do that one first. That's better. Um, but the comment about France uh, doesn't really have content in TNO. I mean, we might have skeleton content, but they'll get a real focus during the next update, so 
probably wait till then to play France, maybe? We'll see. I don't know. We'll see how we feel. The feminine mystique, I've read that quite a few times before. I'm going to do that because we're ahead. I want something more than my husband and my children in my home. So it says, go all the way with LBJ again. I probably should do that campaign like that again. LBJ was a lot of fun. Since else says, well, hello, Mr. Nixon. It's been a while. Um... So, someone says, I can open a TNO with DirectX 11, which my computer can support well, but at least it works for now. That's true. If you can't play TNO, why not play TNO? Someone says, oh well, too bad I can't play because it always crashes sadly. Hopefully they'll fix it soon. So I also asks, does this work with Blood Alone, you know, the DLC for Hearts of Iron 4? And the answer is yes. Yes, it does. Which is very cool. So by 552 is not bad. I'm not sure how much we need. Um, so help us out overall. Do that one as well. 60 is not bad. How's the economy looking? Uh, we have a two and a half billion surplus, which is pretty good. So, 76.1, not bad, not bad, not bad. Actually, you could probably just go there and do fine. Someone says, uh, I have a bug where volunteers get no supply. Help? Uh, that is true. There's a bug currently at the time of this recording. And I have my game set in offline mode. So, we'll see what happens. But, uh, yeah, there's definitely a bug in the time of this recording. Where my volunteers, and maybe even your volunteers, if you play the mod right now too, uh, they don't get supply, which sucks. So. That is a bit too much for me to go and invest in. Uh, nice. Yep. We did. We're going to need as much PP as possible. So it says, I love Nixon. So, we all love Tricky Dick. We read Island under Blue Banners. I've read this before, but read it again anyways, because we did it really well. It almost felt like a crime to strike a match, but more did so anyways. He struck a light and brought it to the end, to, brought it to the end of the cigars, putting, pulling smoke down his throat and into his lungs. You know, if his eyes were watered from the smoke of the landscape that he was currently viewing. All along the ridge line was a desolate forest. Some of the trees smoldered away, blackened husks of tor torched limbs, some merely had scorched marks across their trunks, almost devoid of the smaller branches. He couldn't see a patch of green in the entirety of the forest, nor the villages. They had dwelt by the base of the forest, so his houses had the same treatment, or somehow only somewhat worse. War no way to play his role in the de devastation, caused the war in the country to go from bad to worse. His nation fought the native government, the natives. What justice was there in that? A grim faced officer approached Moore from the streams of trunks. Uh, descending the dirt road, flowing from the Ashton village like a river. Admiral Moore, Commander Alfred is on the line for you. The Admiral followed his junior officer away from the village, leaving his thoughts behind. They didn't do him any good now, he could leave. Uh, those in his journal. Or perhaps a memoir of sort. The man led them through the barracks, mostly abandoned upside from the medical station. The men to defend the area had all packed up in the trucks that had departed moments ago, but the medical bay was still being active for a long time. As he walked by the bay, he caught a glimpse of a child no older than eight. A swarm covered in a bandage soaked through with blood. He clung to the doctor, in front of him, sobbing into his arm. It didn't matter what the circumstances led to this moment. Let bygones be bygones, Moore thought. This is real. He would do whatever it took to mend this crappy situation, no matter how slow or minuscule his efforts might be, calm after the storm. Um, so Madagascar government joins the OFN, becomes a client state of, the, of us, will trend more in the internationalists on the uh, issue of foreign policy, shift to support the RDs a little bit, which is not going to be a really big... Uh, Huge problem. Of course, we'll do this one too. Uh, dismantling the German sphere, forgotten allies, or the South African plan. Now, I like this one because we need to get very involved, but come to South Africa, go. It'll make it difficult to pull out if future events require it, which is, you know, whatever. And then South Africa secured as well. Hard lines. Uh, which one be about? We'll probably do forgotten allies first because I like civilian war spar, which doesn't really matter too much right now. And. Breaking the Pariah State would probably be decent as well if, if we get there. So if you want to read about these, please go right ahead. So, and then meeting with Cassin. Sure, why not? Landfall. The pilot grinned. He'd been waiting a rather long time for any action. Tilting the flight stick forward, he pulled towards the pulled back the throttles as A6 intruder pitched forward and accelerated. He squeezed the trigger slightly at first before growing more firm. The the pull that loose an arc of fire and death directed at the huge hill in front of him at the top which a statue of Christ the Redeemer stood, he, the hill he knew was dotted with fascist artillery. The most important part of any artillery team is the spotters, jobs to find targets and instruct the enemy behind the gun. Today, the spotter certainly spotted something but not a target, an American plane was racing towards his position. It was bringing death, he could see the fire spreading from his gun to its only grimace. The spotter raised the radio to his lips and spoke a warning, a cry for help, nobody could tell. It was drowned up by the sounds of explosions and fire. Plane after plane flew over what had been once an artillery position, signaling that the invasion had begun. The story was unfolding around the Dominican Republic. American planes were pounding military targets below, below the planes, and the sea landing craft crashed on the shore, and over 2,000 men stormed off of them, fighting for liberty, fighting against fascism. 
The attacks on the outside was joined by an attack on the inside. Rebels, insurgents, mobs, they all joined the comrades on the outside in their fight to overthrow the dictator. Guns of all kinds were used from the modern ones supplied by the CIA to ancient firearms that predate the First World War. Makeshift spears, clubs, anything that could help put an end to the regime. The effort paid off. Fort Trujillo had a clear picture of the situation the landing at Puerto Plata succeeded. And shortly after that, the auxiliary landing at Luperon, 30 clicks west, had the same results. In the White House, the situation when President Richard Nixon nodded at the mustached man sitting across from him, video costs were nodded back. Commander Bayo had just in a wire. Perimeter established. Landing a remarkable su success. Proceeding in the next phase, the operation is a go. As these guys are falling apart over here, um, we're going to supply. So we have begun the invasion, which is, seems to be going okay for now. Uh, Dominican Republic. Ah, they're up here. Interesting. Bio, huh? Cosmopolitan Brotherhood. That's interesting. Rebels of Fortune. That's very cool. Internet, internal sectarianism. Sturdy supply lines. That's pretty darn good. Holy crap, that's really good. USN shore shelling. Yeah, anything here? Social nationalism. Lib uh, against this guy. The Puerto Plata invasion. Um, if you're worried about this, please go ahead for the cracking Europa, uh, Fortress Europe. So we go back to the old world. Nice. A burglar in Washington. If you want to do that too, please go ahead as well. Widespread revolts, eh? That should do fine. We can't say anything or anybody, but which sucks, whatever. Um. more attack and defense, which is always pretty good to do. Insurgency strength. I'll go and fight in two months. Well, we can always do this one. We get more daily command power, which we could honestly really use, so. They should do fine as long as they can just capture all this stuff, but then, then again, you have to rely on the AI, which is never reliable, so. They should be able to win. If they don't, well, then we'll probably put some to do so. Splice dwindle. Splice 100 out of 100. Now it's going to be what? 91 out of 100. Uh, they could use more supply. Liberals retain power. Oh, well. There you go. Victory. Evidently, Nick came. Heard the sound of crunching boots on the roads to the palace. He immediately assumed that the Generalissimo Trujillo was coming with a military parade. But this parade was that of triumph. Ones that had come to top of the fascists that had achieved their aims. Arms linked together. Comrade Bayo marched in line with his own comrades in arms. Orobari, Morgan, Menoyo, Cubella, and Camaño. The weapons slung on their back. Found the march of mixed honor guard of legionnaires and rebels. Bayo looked ahead of the elegant dome building that was the National Palace. It wasn't as ornate as the former presidential palace in La Habana, but it kept the same beauty. Yet had it been unscathed from the fighting that took place earlier, the see that Trujillo would become a quick and brutal battleground. Wounds were broken, bullets uh, mark riddled, bullet, bullet marks riddled the walls and pillars, and smoke rose out of the dome where it fire had been put out. The fighting was over, and the scenes that had followed Fidel's triumph now replicated themselves in Dominican streets. Collaborators were being singled out and pushed into cars by rebel forces. While Zoyal's forces surrendered to legionnaires and were led away, hands up and heads bowed. Dugio's portraits burned in the streets, his statues smashed to pieces, the houses of his loyal saluted clean. Rebels helped grieving civilians collect the dead off the streets. The parade halted, and Bayo and his supporters made their way into the palace. Unlike Fidel's revolution, the meeting was tense, not comradely. They all had different versions or visions for the future, and the lines were starting to crack, but they needed to keep public appearances. So they stood in the palace of staffs, arms linked again, until Bio strode to the podium, surrounded by the bands of the Legion. Below him waited OFN Mexican journalists, camera crews, and ensuring crowd waving Cuban and Dominican flags. Bio was no Fidel, but his authoritative voice was an instant uh, attention getter. Revolutionary, today the fascist tyranny of Trujillo is over, and now our reorganization process can begin. I'll serve as head of a provisional junta of all the anti fascist forces until elections may happen. Viva la revolucion! Not bad. Oh, what is this one? Token civil rights? 1963 Scottish Open, if you learn about that, please go right on ahead. I'll go the Japanese, in comes the UFM. The first elections in Malaya since the end of the war are concluded, and it seems that, thankfully, our favorite kind today has come out on top. Abdul Razak Hussein has managed to win the hearts and minds of the people, um, <clears throat> and now sits at the top of the nation, ready to implement his rebuilding plans. A conservative, Razak is exactly the kind of man we want in charge, a moderate, a mu amiable, too. Although Afeni seems to be dedicated to rebuilding the nation, something is obviously needed, uh, given the devastation caused by the war, of course. <clears throat> Uh, uh, Razak's, Razak's, Razak's victory comes off as the best case scenario for us. He is, unlike his opponents, quite palatable to our interests, and he will without a doubt cooperate with us in the near and far future. As we're already in talks with him for Malaya to join the OFN as an observer, it's obvious that his victory has secured uh, the status of his country as an American ally. However, we're not entirely done with Malaya yet. 
But his near guaranteed entry to the OFN comes in need for economic and humanitarian aid, as we obviously cannot let Razak and the Malayan people deal with the devastation of the country themselves. Such an endeavor may be costly. It's also an opportunity for us. By funneling money and resources into Malaya, we can make sure that it will stay a reliable ally force no matter what happens. All this wasn't for naught. Wasn't for naught in the end. More political power? Sure. Why not? The UFF thwarts off Japanese invaders. From July 20th, 1963, should be the date placed firmly in history. The United Filipino Front, a result of the close cooperation between the USFIP and the Hooks in the North, finally bore in fruit. As possibly without this alliance, perhaps the outcome of the war in the Philippines could have been different entirely since the 40s. The islands. Well, the Philippines have been ravaged by war and suffering, and has been shown no, no sign of ending until now. When the mutual military headquarters of the United Filipino Front were reported victory against the Japanese 14th Army, the last of their men have fled the islands or surrendered to local forces. The good news is that to stop our as talks of unification between Luis Taruk and Lorenzo Tenayanda have commenced with the hope of finally ending divisions within the island after decades of separation. With all influence from the decrepit collaborations government or any subversive forces gone, both factions are now free to determine the future of the islands as they please. A new concept has emerged, a coalition government. The new unified series of plans shall be called the Coalition Government of the Republic of the Philippines, with an emphasis of close cooperation between the Socialists, Tenada's Nationalist Party, and the will of the people, and this finally blood shall stain the island of war. Our task is not yet done, however, we shall rebuild the revoked islands, and we shall pave the way to a bright future of our free and independent Philippines. And when all is said is done, we shall celebrate this momentous event as a great victory for the free world, and thus a further loss of the Japanese Imperials. Let us begin, which I did force these two to, like, cooperate, which, which is fine with me because I haven't done that route yet, I think. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure I haven't, so. They're allied together, and they're doing alright with the United Filipino Front. There's no unique focus here. So Period resolution 13. Oh, well. The atmosphere is nothing but on edge. Despite the chill of the New York City, when maneuvering between the skyscrapers as dirty snow lined the streets below, the OFN headquarters interior is intense with heat. The lights above slowly burn the OFN delegations as they whisper among themselves, tensely waiting for orders on how to vote on security resolution 13. Then, President Nixon emerged and all eyes locked on him. Taking a seat at the table, he prepared the paper in his hand, swallowed it before speaking into the microphone. Let me point out that this meeting helps us unite our lines, asserts as a visible demonstration that the OFM remains behind a commitment to the free rule, Nixon began. We're the remaining free nations of the world. Our defeat and humiliation in World War II pro promoted recklessness in the councils of those powers who have not yet abandoned their goals of world conquest, and so the defense of freedom is everyone's business, not just America's business. We're going to stand aloof and leave the fate of South Africa to the board of rebellion in the Africa shield. We must stand ready in the face of Nazi aggression. Surpass security. <clears throat> Our resolution 13 means that we have finally incited the stand for freedom that we've been seeking these past decades. Thank you. The delegations of spectators exchanged glances as the words set in and the room's anxiety subsided. An ear blistering standing ovation followed. Nixon, too, felt his anxiety subside. The vote was unanimous. Heck, even Brazil ratified the resolution. There wasn't a gosh darn chance that the Nazis put down their arms and withdrew within 24 hours. Perfect. Not even her block. And every dude at the post of the towns could somehow spin into a failure. The free roll could make a stand. 64 would be a breeze. They'd rather die on the feet than live on the knees. A focus sheet will change. Which we have been doing our commitment to African democracy and a few other focuses as well, which I've just been doing. Oh my god, what was this? Oh goodness. Um, I've done these ones as well, integrate the support. Ooh, lock into the reformer. Ooh, pass the bill and secure the support of Congress before we can directly support our favorite candidate. We did break open the caches, helping out a friend, integrate the support. Our South African plan, as well as commitment to African democracy, but, you know, whatever. Smashing the down was the Nazis won. I'm not sure about... Not one to go around bragging about losses, but I'm not stupid either. The Nazis won, and there's not much you can do about this, that. And there wasn't until, anyways, until now. Until this, at least. Well, the crowds fell, though. We wouldn't take extra action. We haven't had this good the shot since 41, really, and I intend to fight until the last for the freedom. No matter where it may be, we've never had a real victory to claim since the Great War, and I'll be the man to change that, no matter the gosh darn cost. If anyone can put down the deranged delusions of those brown shirts, I will be. Um, I'll be the one to do it. Even if it has to be in South Africa, of all places. Now, this one, okay, so this one probably, we're just going to cancel it anyways, because it's going to cancel it too. Dominoes and kicks are the media. Times have changed in, in our new American society. The president does not have as much influence over his people as he would like. We need to get a message out of the media to guarantee public support for the upcoming struggle. Our people will need to know that we are defending a weak democracy that currently stands alone against the illuminated Nazi presence. While the newspaper printing propaganda every day, if it means we'll garner public support. Anyone who can read about public, uh, more balanced court, please go ahead. Uphold the father, found, founding father's ideals. And we can send some dudes down to South Africa as well. How many can we send? Only two. That sucks, but whatever. You're going to go back down there and I'll send some planes down here as well. Nice. Can we not send planes? There we go. Two things. Oh, those boys, huh? Cast some fighters. Here we go. Into the deep we go. Or is it just nothing but fighters? Muscovine's disillusion. Ooh. Yeah, hey, we'll see when we get there. Peace conference. Yes, yes.
So you're down here. Oh, we're going to send one. Well, we're doing some very serious bombing here, which is fine with me. Um, other than that, we're still sending some guys down. Can't really do anything here. Oh, we did keep Jamaica in the OFN. Or, or the, you know, you know, OFN pretty, pretty much. And the game's lagging because of Muscovine, but we'll see what happens uh, soon. A Christmas miracle. The Christmas season was normally a busy, busy time under normal circumstances on Capitol Hill. There were always last-minute scrambles for budgets, bills, and other legislative matters before the break. It was made even worse this year with the South African War, while the normalcy had somewhat settled. McCormick had never a spare moment. A throw clear behind him, Mr. President. Despite the initial confusion over the chain of command, now several months in, everyone had decided to call him that. Our arrangements have been made, as legally sound as possible, that would be effectively let him hold the authority of president, even if it wasn't technically constitutional. McCormick frankly didn't care if everything he got done un undone later. All that would matter was getting through the first. What is it? He asked the staff, rolling characteristically entered without knocking, even more uncharacteristically, was smiling widely. I had completed their eradication, he said. We crossed the threshold. The 22nd Amendment is now in effect. McCormick immediately sat down and waved a relief washing over him in the news. The amendment was such a small thing, just outlining the slain succession. But these past months had shown just how critical it was. He found it difficult to express his relief knowing that no one else would need to go through what he had had. All he wanted for Christmas was for this crisis to end. And by an act of providence, it appeared that it had. He took a breath, stood, and spoke to the staffer who was waiting patiently for what to do next. Call the press, we'll have some good news to share for once. The Spirit of 76. Air Force, aboard Air Force One, Nixon rested in the President's private office, his neck craned over to read the daily briefing sitting on his desk, alone with only the hum of the aircraft's engines filled the silence. The President skimmed through the papers, wielding a pen as he scribbled through his thoughts onto a yellow notebook in his lap. Near the end of the briefing, Nixon paused, curiosity behind his eyes. He had read the last paragraph slowly to himself before reaching for a nearby telephone. An onboard CIA officer stepped in, uh, only to be met with Nixon's questioning, perhaps prying tone. What is this? The officer's gaze switched between the President's and the briefing that lay on the desk. Well, was this some kind of joke? That would be your daily briefing, sir, uttered the puzzled officer. I know what it is, God darn it. I want to know what the heck it's talking about, Nixon growled. Turning the briefing so that it faced the officer, Nixon scooted forward and pointed to the last paragraph. The officer leaned forward and squinting his eyes, finally realizing what troubled the president, he quickly straightened himself. We've determined that the explosion in the public support for intervention in the South African war is a social phenomenon more than anything else, the officer began clearly. This support is subject to a rapid change in response to what happens on the front lines. Furthermore, recent data suggests that our military's personnel performance relies on the public support for their duties, and Nixon suddenly nodded along. We've also found that while many Americans believe the war is just five many this may not be the case for the future conflict. The officer paused, almost hesitant to continue. I advise you to read the memorandum in West Africa for more details, Mr. President. I see. Keep me updated on the situation. Our front mechanics are now unlocked. We're still trying to about the Philippines, which is fine. Um, oh, so we have the home front now, because I didn't understand, because we have several decisions here. Start a media campaign. It improves optics, hawkishness, uh, war press, less rights. But you have more weekly war support, which is really nice. You lose weekly political power, though. Hawkishness, more command power would be very nice. The home front. This is definitely new. Oh, my God, what the heck? Holy crap. If we're to continue our campaigns to ensure that OFN and the free world continue to defend itself and liberate the oppressed people of the world, spare them out the American people. Be on board with their efforts. Public support directly affects the ability of our troops to perform work. Or preform. That's to say, if the public is happy, our troops are happy. Troop morale represents the way our boys on the ground, skies, and seas feel about the engagements they're in and how they think the public sees them. It's pretty much that they know if the public is behind them, unless they perform poorly or worse, take their frustration out on others. A trust in government represents the public's Ability and the generals and leaders' ability to see through these conflicts to completion with minimal losses for our troops. Optics represent how well the conflicts are broader being portrayed and the effect it has on the perception back home. Hawkishness. How supportive the public is of sending our boys overseas to fight for the freedom and fight tyranny wherever it appears. Service manpower fulfillment represents the ability to ensure that we have enough manpower in the field to successfully complete our operations. Expanding operations and increasing the scope of our existing operations will cause this number to decline, jeopardizing the ability to ensure a victory for our forces. It must be kept as high as possible at all times. Trust in government, optics, and everything else. We must not let any of them fall too low or we risk very serious consequences on the battlefield. 75%. Oh, political power for more command power. Well, currently 60. Trust in government is currently 60. Weekly stability and political power gain. Hawkishness is to currently 25. Why don't we increase that? Troop morale is 68. This is definitely different that we got to get used to now. Um, other than that... Um, what if we don't increase it? Because we do want the... MPP to win the next election, so. But we're doing Security Resolution 14. It's a beautiful thing, you know. We're seeing all kinds of flags alongside America's in South Africa. It really is a fighting for freedom, or whatever the heck the press is calling it. But every time we get news from the front lines, there's some gosh darn incident about nearly screws up the entire thing. The Pentagon told us recently that, my God, some South African dudes nearly opened fire on their own soldiers. We're not going to blow the heck out of the Nazis if they're up against a bunch of booties with guns. 
Laird and some fellows from the Cross who often talked about passing another resolution in the next Security Council meeting. They want a unified command structure to streamline the war effort and avoid miscalculation or miscommunication. And some of them floated Westmoreland as its commander. We'll introduce it, we'll pass, and we'll turn this gosh darn war to example for our future generations. If you're ready by the Shinano files, please go right ahead. Oh, he stopped the war, and this is how they treat him? A logistical nightmare. The war is never going to be a straightforward affair. We all knew that, no matter what the press might paint it as. Apparently, now, our biggest issue is the logistics of sending tons of thousands of foreign to a land, into a foreign land, with tens of thousands of other soldiers from other countries. Now, how the generals didn't foresee this company becoming an issue is almost shocking. Yet here we are again, cleaning up the heck of a mess we shouldn't have even had. The only issue is going to be building up all the ports, bases, airports, and a thousand other things. I'm sure. The one thing the historian pundits will ever talk about when it comes to the last wars: logistics. You know, logistics we won and lost on. Logistics of England. Logistics of Asia. Logistics of logistics. If anyone's going to help me fix this problem, then it's going to be them, the men of logistics. Picking up steam, Sergeant Freeman sat upright on the olive green cot beneath him, a newspaper in his hands, a tent above him, protected from the sun's scorching heat. It had been rough two weeks. Every order received was incoherent, and all the intelligence relayed to him uh, turned out to be bogus. Heck, he'd even let his men into the savannah and nearly engage a South African platoon until they identified themselves. Sergeant's daydreaming ended when the headline caught his attention. OFM passed security resolution 14. He read out loud to the rest of the tent. Some good after news for once, maybe they'll let us burn these crowds alive next. The ten exchanged glances, some taking the news as a sign from God, others simply not caring. Private Wood, stretched out on his cot, stiffly turned his head towards the sergeant, opened his mouth. What's security resolution 14? He, uh, Freeman skimmed through the newspaper before looking up, his hawkish gaze locking out of the privates. Sets up a single command structure instead of letting every one of our effing allies run this crap show their own way, the sergeant barked. Reading through the newspaper once again, he adjusted himself before continuing. It says here that Westmoreland is supposed to be leading it. They gave him some fancy title, Supreme Allied Commander. They let all chuckle before finally topping it off, and it makes everyone to use the F OFM flag when fighting the Krauts. Wood's eyes drifted to the tent ceiling as he did release a long, exaggerated sigh. As long as it wins us this war faster, it began with his distinct ma magnolia accent. Can't take half measures no more. I mean, look at what happened last time. The private yawns, shifting in his cot before eventually dozing off. Whatever it takes, Freeman thought. The free roll presses on. So one more volunteer the South African... Union of South Africa. Oh. <clears throat> Here's the thing about Africans, they're not exactly who you consider reliable partners. People get themselves tied up in knots for us saying that. They'll scream to the high heaven about how Nixon's a gosh darn bigot, but it's true. They a hell of a time governing themselves, they don't listen to orders well, and heck, a lot of them are probably so cannibals. But all that said, you have to recognize that the press is on their side, with all the pictures in the papers, very good pictures, you know. The whole gosh darn country is up in arms about helping these so-called refugees escape from the Nazi dudes. It's the only thing in the world that's getting John Connolly and John Cohen yours. Conyers singing from the same hymn sheet. It's a common sense to do something about the mess for strategic and political value. Let's call up some of our contacts with the OFN and see if we can come together to provide some safety and relief to the poor dudes. Maybe leak it to the towns or, while we're, that we're doing it too. Nice. Oral interview Barnes, L. Hay Woods, PFC, uh, Second Recon Battalion. Um, my mother raised me proper and she used to call it, call it that. She never liked. Uh, she said, I'd never be like the boys who teased me at school for being from the poor end of the South Central because I've been raised to be better than them. Funny how that changed once I joined the Army, of course. But I like to think of myself as a man of words, not a fist. At least not when I'm off duty. Never expected to get myself in a situation like this, at least, at any rate. I have three siblings at home. Lord knows I've put, built patience for each of them. But those South Africans, man, I thought dealing with my own brothers was annoying. But when I was off duty, I swear I was on more on edge than the darn foothills. There ain't nothing like finding out your own men got a tighter set of lips on them than the people you're trying to help. Listen. I know you're recording to try to document this. I just want to say that I ain't trying to uh, stereotype the whole god darn country. Just, it's just that. I got some Uncle Tom Fuller going on in there. Heck, the reason I got in a scuffle, I hope I held my own in there, was while I was trying to get a light on some R&R &R in a coastal town I've been rotated to. And I met soldiers from the 45th Battalion, SAAF. I fought with them. Well, my unit fought with them for two months. I thought they'd recognize me from my tab when I hit them up for a light. You know what they told me? They took point of the darn Zulu soldiers down the street and told me this part of town was, well, whites only. Darn the Afrikaans to heck. I didn't come here to find stupid lily white powder boys so I could get let from them off duty. And I don't regret what I did either. Next. I'm Recon, remember? Learned Zulu as part of my translation duties. I'm gosh darn glad I did too. Look on those Zulu's faces. I should have lit my cigarette with that. Heck, I say they. And they say black skins hide the heart. I've never met a nice South African. Take back the skies. We're in the Navy. Too many people forget that. We first saw. We saw firsthand the kind of devastation. Might that the U.S. can inflict on one given the chance? Whether it's not so gosh darn concerned about playing fair and limiting civilian casualties, we know better than anyone, better than the eggheads at least, how different things could have been during the war if we'd just gone the upper hand in the skies, but if we'd eliminated the enemy planes and gotten our bombers in the skies over Japan or Germany. We're not going to make some of the same mistakes that sunk Dewey and left American soldiers exposed to bombings. We're going to push back this joint aerial assault by the German cocksuckers, no matter what the cost. Send deploy the anti aircraft weapons, the launcher of fighter planes, and bolts to the common South African military. We'll bring heck to the uh, African interior and take back the skies one way or another, and according to Allied deployment. 
When people think of the OFN, they think of a grand united force destined to stop fascism at every corner of the earth. Now, this is great. It inspires a hell of a lot of people, but frankly, they're thinking that America, not the OFN. Our allies don't have it as good as we do, and we know this is because the poor dudes are struggling to spy the soldiers in South Africa. They're tough sons of guns and all for what it's worth, but we need them to fix this up before the Nazis grind them up. McNamara compiled his mathematics, no, statistics, whatever the heck he does, and his reports say that all the military infrastructure is a gosh darn mess. If we build it up and make it as efficient as possible, we'll be making sure that our allies can contribute everything they can to the war. We'll have an easier time keeping South Africa on its feet, and the dudes will have America to thank for that. They can always thank America. And they better thank America. Oh, also, Philippine stuff, frontline stuff, doesn't really matter to me. Ah, 44 days, and this will be done 14, we'll be done with 100%, nice. Divert. Ooh. Then power continues to deplete. So now we're 67. 60. 25. Tomorrow the 76. Who armed professionalism is going down, huh? Bro, that sucks. Let's keep it over here so we can at least get the Philippines thing done. Um, training and research. What do we have over here? Intelligence. That's good. Yes, you can. Seven active agents is not bad. Oops. And let's do this too. Because this one's only going to take 15 days, which is pretty nice, though. So. Um, overall, can we do well here? Actually, let's look it up. So, we have these guys over here. The coalition government of the Philippines. Quite literally. Um, this is... Divine Mandate of Siberia. Oh, no. Hey, man. How you doing? Let's see. The German Civil War is still firing and going on. We have a lot of RKM-56. Lombard. Dissolution, huh? There's a lot of attack. French state. How's, uh... We didn't even get decisions for Himmler, which sucks. Is that a bug? I thought we were supposed to get decisions to like, help supply them. There's some volunteers or do anything about that. Sucks that they're gonna lose, though. Do we win here? Border Republic. Don't want to win too fast. America to the rescue. Chicago Radio 3 p.m. Oh, so we have uh, us with here today, Phyllis Schlafy. Self public commentator on the foreign policy from St. Louis and one of the few women writers on the subject today. Ms. Schlafy, the country's uni united in horror of the scenes coming out of South Africa, and thousands of men are answering the president's call to join the military to defend the democracy. You've written about the need for America to pick its battles. Is this is a battle America should fight. Schlafy, of course. When the Nazis are beating down the door of any civilized nation, be it France, Russia, England, or now South Africa, America has an obligation to stand against March fascism. I applaud the president for the decision to defend South Africa, but. I provided that as a brief engagement, and a miracle will stand against fascism with one of the few friends we have left between Washington and Canberra, but we should not, cannot, confuse defending democracy with building it from the ground up in Africa, and what I hear coming out of Washington worries me. Like what Senator Margaret Smith's been saying? More like Senator Jackson. I understand chomping at the bit to get the Nazis a bloody nose, but America's democracy wasn't built overnight. We can help the South Africans defend their democracy, but we've got no business making open-ended commitments I can't see how we can fulfill. Now that the gods of America's traditional Judeo-Christian values, this was Ms. Schlafy, Phil Schlafy, next, America to the rescue. George Ball lifted the sleeve of his suit and checked his watch. Marched through the whole fence headquarters was nothing new to him, but the circumstances transformed it into an intimidating structure. Representing the United States was one thing, but he also had to contend with the, leading the free world in South Africa. It was as if the moon, stars, and all the planets had fallen on him. The weight had nearly broken him, but now was not the time to give up, nor his voice about or voice his reservations about South Africa. Ball, now with the Security Council, and he leaned forward in his chair. His hands clasped together as he rested on his round table. The words, United States, were displayed proudly in the nameplate that hung off the end as conversations echoed throughout the chamber. He tapped his foot on the floor, and when the session finally began and the camera was trained on him, he drew a deep breath. <clears throat> and many major capitals that already sounds a deep concern of the present state of the refugee crisis, Ball said into the microphone sternly, are joining Salaam to secure and maintain the political independence and territorial integrity of South Africa. But, Ball began as he gripped a Washington Post article, lifting it in the air for all to see, we must also be willing to assist the people that have experienced horrors of Nazism directly. Putting the photograph of the front page of an African family marching through the exhausted savannah to escape the bloodshed, Ball continued, tens of thousands of refugees have already crossed the border, and that number is going to grow. We must consider a major effort by all of us to deliver economic and humanitarian aid to South Africa. Ball's words went with approval as the delegation nodded to each other, and when the voting began, they began to cast eyes without hesitation. No man left behind. Turning the tables. The Romans were all about warfare. They were fighters. They thought offense was the best defense, which they were right about. The Romans knew their stuff, even if their last six emperors were a... Uh, <clears throat> Look at the point is, we gotta get tough. We've been fighting the Nazi dudes for the past two months, and now they've got the chance to make sure this gosh darn war ends up in the history books. They thought they could get away with us testing on, us and going on a little gosh darn adventures into South Africa. They thought we'd just sit back and they'd, we'd stay on our back foot, now we're in a position to retaliate, to bomb the heck out of them, and to push into their own land, and that's exactly what we're gonna do. We're not gonna repeat the countless mistakes made in the war, and if every gosh darn thing we do somehow fails, then it becomes that time we consider alternatives and proclaim a state of emergency. 
Most fellows who understand the kind of power is vested in the office of the president, sure. Every great schooler in the country learned about the separation of powers and how Congress is the only part of the government that granted the capacity to declare war, but we all know that ain't true. The United States Congress couldn't prosecute a gosh darn war for try. We learned that prior in the 1940s and every war since then. And even before then. Luckily, presidents found a way around the incompetence of the other branches. They have learned how to use executive orders. <clears throat> Uh, and emergency declarations to do all sorts of things that limp arrested senators would never vote to approve. Why, we can mobilize industries and bolster national security. We can affect troop uh, movements in our capacity as commander in chief. We can reorder society stuff in pursuit of the national interests. All of it is possible without, with a single stroke of a president's pen. And all of it is in our The control. desire for revenge. Restaurant patrons listen to the radio static. The food growing cold. Children's eyes are glued to the TV screen as parents watch apprehensively from the kitchen. As if the nation came to a standstill in the Oval Office, Nixon quietly shuffled the papers in his hands as the filming crew in front of him began counting down. The president drew a deep breath as he looked into the camera's lens and for a moment he saw America looking back at him. Good evening, my fellow Americans. Tonight I want to talk to you on the subject of a deep concern to all Americans and to many people in all parts of the world. The war in South Africa. He forced the words out of his mouth, having paced the White House at night, Russ, as he tormented himself over the speech's content. The war is necessary to continue. It's not an easy choice, but it's the right choice. Allowing South Africa's future to be determined by the victory of a military contest between themselves and the Boer Rebellion, along South Africa's shield will be a betrayal of our allies. He paused, assuming a gentle tone before continuing. I consider the question of what choice we have if we are to end the war, and so I've chosen to proclaim a national emergency concerning South Africa. This policy of the war effort by allowing for the mobilization of our military personnel and allowing the administration to direct the production of war materials. With the confidence of our allies and confidence in ourselves, we will defend South Africa's freedom from the Nazi aggression. If we succeed, generations will come to say of us, now living that we've mastered our moment, and that we help make the world safe for mankind. Thank you and good night. America processed the words, some excited, others anxious, as a fire ignited within itself, or a fire ignited itself with them. From that moment on, there was no backing down. A giant, a oh, sleeping giant awoken and filled with terrible resolve. I also keep doing what we're doing. Um, but we're not going to do anything about that too much, in all honesty. Where are we at for this? Ah, oh, we're lagging. Because it's obviously. Manpower continues to deplete, which is whatever it is, you know. Um, yeah. Is it, does the outer ring mean anything? Yeah, Tino is just so lucky. Come on. Um, what are stability? Stability. 71, not bad. 32 is not bad. 100% is not bad. Um, on that note, not too much else. But it's only beginning in 1964, so I'm not super concerned. As we're going back and doing our commitment to African democracy, if you're any of that, that, please go ahead. We got a bomb back in the Stone Age, though. Let's we'll see what we can do. Can you guys go right here? Dixie sleeps again. Oh, I have a recent discord that plagued the nation. Tensions appear to be cooling in the increasingly fractious South. Over the recent weeks, there have been significantly fewer instances of politically or racially motivated violence in rallies in major southern cities. Both pro and anti segregation have markedly fewer marchers. Tell and tell whether or not this recent calm will hold over the rest of tensions will soon be inflamed after yet another tragedy. At least for now, we have some time to catch breath. Can't get any worse than if we ignore it, right? So we do with most problems. That's a GDP's debt to GDP ratio is getting better. Um, GDP is doing okay. So overall, not bad. Escape plans. Um, if you're worried about this, please go ahead. I oh Pearl Harbor Monument as well. If you're worried about this, please go ahead too. And the rockets are glare, the bombs bursting in air. Um, maybe I've not read this one. You have to forgive me, Director, but my knowledge of Indonesia is not exactly scholarly, so this prison in Yogi Yogi Akarta. What's it like? President Richard Nixon asked with determination, leaning over his desk. Well, it's no Alcatraz, but still not your average county prison. I was looking on the outskirts of the city, surrounded by fields on all sides, its guards armed and loaded 24 hours a day with concrete walls and cells. There are only two entrances to the facility, both guarded by machine gun turrets and the guard towers. The President leaned back. As it processed the information, all right, well, what can be done? I assume you wouldn't describe a fortress like that if you didn't already have a plan. With a smile, the CIA director extolled his plans to the president with all the acceptance the intimidating officer would allow. Well, the easy thing to do is to leave it up to the local FRI cell. They know the area in prison better than we do, although they are, uh, they are materially capable as, as another story, of course. Alternatively, we could send in a special force team with the FRI, though it would be cost and cost us more trouble for cop. Staring back in contemplation, the president left the director in a moment of silence. How much was one man's life worth? The president thought, was it worth a few more American men or just a few Indonesian lives? The director seemed to be trusted the FRI. Perhaps it would be enough. Then again, a few extra men would not hurt either. With that, he sigh, opened his mouth, and gave the director's answers. Don't leave it a chance. See what you can do is we're slowly pushing through all these guys. Cape Town Sea Lift. I'm going to read about the, the DOJ begins investigation. Um... Let's see, the South Africans needed those guns in Cape Town yesterday. Don't keep me, keep me waiting like this again, Major General Bigelow snapped. We're slamming the phone receiver down on the representative from Norfolk and Western Railway. After sparing a second for a quiet sigh, he 
picked up the receiver again. He poured over the rail timetables provided by the Warden's score. Outside Big Lowe's office, the young mayor, Major Winston turned to his colonel as the phone and receiver crashed in again. I know we're all up to our eyeballs organizing the sea left of South Africa, but what's the guy, General Big Lowe, so worked up? Whatever supplies South Africans didn't abandon the burning through in days, the colonel replied testily. They're throwing all the munitions and men they have at the Nazis, and soon they'll be out of both, and besides, the colonel pointed at a campaign medal on the general's desk. Two years ago, Major Big Lowe was a logistics officer during the defense of Britain. President Kennedy was slowly getting slow getting industry to mobilize her to send over 80 brigade could, bag, buy, or divert. The major's eyes widened and made the connection. It wasn't enough. Now this time, gosh darn it. But we'll see what we can do. We'll slowly keep winning, but not really. Uh, I did tell the Navy to stop training. Um, so, yeah. We're moving to African democracy, expanded business ties, protecting our interests. And South Africa secured, of course. Fires are suffering. There's no silence in the high valley, for it's broken by the crunching of boots on the sandy road through the rocks and dust. Land without water, but for that deep in the earth's embrace, the soldiers fearing to step too far into the arid basins and be lost to the agony and solitude of high places. Back by the bleak vastness of the sky, the weary Americans passed through the crawl. It was barely a village, a collection of shacks made of rubbish and dry wood. A handful of emaciated goats and sheep who gazed forlornly on the men as they made their way into the center of the feeble settlement. Their leader, a boy with a patchy fuzz on his upper lip, looked around him into the houses and saw in the gaps between the planks the sullen red faces staring at him with the hateful eyes of the conquered. Evacuate, he called once or twice. They only glared and snarled up in their pig speech, and the boy felt his anger stoked at the contempt. Forward emotion, and the masked men approached with their strange machines, and the villagers watched them in confusion. Without further warning, the fire poured forth, and the shacks went up in flames. Screaming, they began to flee, clutching babies and valuables, clashing to the ground as shots ripped through the air, tearing into the sunburned, sunburned skin and fountains of blood. Within minutes, all of the on consuming fire cleansed the village from the face of the earth. All that remained was the ash and the bodies, and the boy commander gazing upon the destruction he had wrought with faraway eyes. Sitting through the remains, Americans found no evidence of the hidden bore cache they had come so far to find. As dry thunder boomed over the high veil, they turned and returned the way they come between the jagged rocks back down the sandy road. Angers like fire, it burns all clean. Okay. The first sign that something was wrong was the power went out 30 minutes before the lights out on the cells. That had been enough to get the guards worried, but they had no way of knowing anything else was wrong until the door of the cell block was thrown open. Armed the American. Secure the American. There. The screaming guards had exploded, and the guards outside Alan Pope's cell were similarly cut down by the gunshots, cutting twice into their bodies and once into their heads. As the inmates roared at the sight of their tormentor's death, a group of five men scoured the cell block, coming to a stop outside Alan's cell. While getting you out, the man unlocked the cell door. We're pumping a rifle round of the prostate body of the guard assigned to Alan. Just making sure. Can you move? Yeah, I can move. I can use a weapon. No need, no offense, but we don't need any more surprises in this op now. The lights came back on, followed by a second later by the blaring of the prison's alarm system. Alan scrambled to the center of the American Special Forces team, tapping the one who did the talking on the shoulder to let him know he was ready. So close and move when we tell you to follow our orders until we get to the boat. The plane. Follow our orders until we get to the plane. Boat. Well, we can do the boat. And if it's wrong, then good God, it's probably wrong. Rocky ride. Alan Pope's heart had sunk when he saw the speedboat hastily moored to the pier that the American's black ops team to pull it up to. They had to shake numerous Indonesian patrols on the way there, each one sent careening to the side of the road by expertly placed shots on the driver's head, which made for a deeply uncomfortable ride for Alan. The speedboat promised no relief, and exactly as he expected, the boat powered in the sea at maximum speed. The lights along the shoreline sank into the distance as the boat roared into the inky blackness of the night sky, or night sea. Every time the boat and slammed back into the water after cresting a wave, Alan swallowed a mouthful of sea spray, deafened by the roar of the outboard engine. Finally, the engine's cacophony melted, uh, mellowed in a low hum, followed by the blinding light of searchlights being fixed on the boat. He felt a gentle bump as a speedboat pulled alongside a large trawler, one with the Australian flag flying from its stern. Easy, easy, one of the American commanders warned an Australian sailor's pulp was hauled up the rope rather thrown over the side of the larger ship, man's disoriented after the escape. Uh, we got you, Mr. Pope. The Australian sailor carrying Pope and a fireman's carry up the ladder, handed, uh, rushed away after depositing him on, him on deck, only to come back with a cup of tea. We're taking you home. The taste of freedom. Nice. American Japanese tensions decreased by 5% for total attention of 50%. But I'm going to end the episode here because I've been doing this for a while. So um, if you enjoyed the video, though, please do consider leaving a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below. And I'll see you tomorrow. See what else we can do with America as Nixon is probably not going to be surviving as president. Hopefully in the next episode. Thanks for watching. Have a great, great, tricky dick rest of your day.